Yes, thank you for the precious praise of our Hosanna Choir. And as our presiding, as our presiding elder read for us, I would like to share the message of the word entitled, The Foolish Way of the Cross, based on today's scripture reading of 1 Corinthians 1.18. And so the title is The Foolish Way of the Cross, and I'm not the one calling it foolish, but it's it written in the scripture that we've read today. And you may have heard a saying in the world that says we work on or cultivate the way. And this can also be phrased as walking the way. Every religion holds, holds its respective way and going down that path is described as cultivating the way. So it's not an expression just used in Buddhism or Taoism, but it's also described in the Bible. So today's main passage in 1 Corinthians 1.18 speaks of the path we walk as the way of the cross or the path of the cross. Jesus also described himself by saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He described himself as the way in John 14, verse 6. So without going through me, no one can go to the Father. This is a soul path. So I will walk that path. Follow me. So this path to the Father that Jesus describes, was he the first to pave that way? So we're going to study today about this path. As our first main point, this way did not always exist. This way did not always exist. And I don't know if it's a generational gap, but the concept that our youth have is different. They think of a path or a way as one made of asphalt or concrete. That, that are, those are the roads made by each city or district before our elderly members, when we talk of the Korean War, how there was nothing to eat, they say, oh, but you could have had ramen. So they have no idea what it means to lack food. The same thing with a path. I'm not talking about the path that has been paved by machinery, but hikers would know there's a lot of trees And in the middle of these trees, there's a path where there's no trees, but it's just a large and long swath of ground or dirt. And when they follow that path, they see heights until they finally reach the top. So did this path exist from the time the mountain was formed? That path amidst the trees, was it always there? No. Someone had to walk that path. A second person, a third person, even a hundred people. And it's only after then that the path is made. So the presence of a road signifies that there is a destination to be reached. The fact that this path remains even with the passing of time means that people have come and gone on it. That's the meaning of a path. 
All people in the world walk a path, wherever or whatever it may be, and they walk it with their beliefs and convictions. And they think, this is the right path. This path will lead me to happiness. But at times, they lose their way. What they were once sure of, there are times where, and it, but the path turns out not to be what they thought it would be. They lose their way and wander. Is this the right path? A lot of people are going down it, so it must be right. And at the end of this road, will what I want be there? That's how the majority of people think. So they hope for this path. But when they lose confidence in that path, they look around at their surroundings. And they're at sometimes comforted by seeing who else is on them with on that path oh that person's here and that person too if that person's on it this is probably the right path and we feel safe seeing those people but the way spoken of in today's scripture reading of 1 Corinthians 1 18 It's not as assuring from the world's perspective. Rather, it looks foolish. And they cannot understand the people who are walking that path. Why do you keep trying to walk down that foolish path? And they call those people walking in it stubborn foolish, unable to be understood. And that's what moria, <laughs> the Greek word for foolish means. However, the first one to walk in this foolish path was Jesus. By walking in it and completing it, he ultimately reveal the power of God through and through. According to Matthew 26, verse 24, Jesus said, The Son of Man is to go just as it was written of Him. So written of Him in the Bible. So the path Jesus walked He's not the one to have walked in it first, but it was one that was prophesied of throughout the scriptures. And Jesus knows what's at the end of that path. This path described in various forms in the Bible. Even though it's one of hardship and affliction, he did not reject it, but walked in it. It wasn't a path that guaranteed good things or prosperity. It's the way of the cross. Unfair. Why was Jesus crucified as a sinner when he is not a sinner? They released a murderer but crucified Jesus. For what sin? It was an unjust, a way of injustice, of sadness. And even though and there is no way to appeal because no one would listen. So that way of the cross of sorrow and justice was one that he walked. Why? Because it was the Father's command. And he knew that the Father's command is eternal life. That's why he walked that path. And he completed the path of the cross to its completion. As our second main point, there are people who pave the way. 
the first main point was that the way doesn't always exist, or it did not exist from the beginning, but there are people who pave the way. They're the pioneers or trailblazers of this path. So it's most difficult for them. Would they have known from the beginning that this was the path? No. It's definitely not easy to find an unknown path. And there are probably people who have lost their lives in search of that path. And they went down that road but found out that wasn't the way. So they had to go back and start all over. So it's to try again and again until they finally find that path. And it's the same with the Bible or in the Bible. First, there was Abraham who went from Ur the Chaldeans to Haran and then from Haran to Canaan. And each time he moved, there was something he had to lay down or cast out. When he left Ur the Chaldeans, he had to separate himself from his country, his relatives, his father's household. I'm sorry, his country and his relatives. But when he had to go from Haran to Canaan, he had to not only leave his country, his relatives, but also his father's house. And he had to only follow the word. I said earlier, when people walk in a row but they are not confident in it and nervous about it, they look around them at the people around them and by seeing them they gain confidence. But what about Canaan? Was there anywhere for him to look to? No. He followed only the word. There was nothing to look at but the word. That's the kind of place Canaan was. And did God tell Abraham exactly where to go? No. Let's say I said, Oh, Deacon, go, hurry. Then of course, it would be natural to ask, Where? And if I just said, Go for now. Is there anybody who would just get in their car and start driving? And if I call them, how far have you gone? Okay, then where are you going next? If I answer, just go, how many people would set out? It's natural to set out only when we know where we're going. According to Genesis 12:1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. So we think that the land which God will show Abraham is Canaan, but that's not so. Hebrews 11 verse 8 reads, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. The land God shows is the land for that day. Here, go up to here. What about tomorrow? I'll let you know tomorrow. Here today, there tomorrow. That he went out not knowing where he was going means, does that mean there was a road or not? No, there was no path. So our founding pastor described the land of Canaan as an unprecedented land, meaning that those before Abraham had never stepped foot in that land. It was the land of the unknown where no one had gone before. But Abraham went there following only the word 
and thus they came to the land of Canaan. So Abraham was the first person to go to Canaan. He was the trailblazer or the pioneer of that path. And would there be anybody else saying, I can go a different way? No. Whose way must we go? We must go in the way paved by Abraham in order to arrive in Canaan. And another figure in the Bible who pioneered a new way is Moses. So here we see a map, and it seems complicated with a lot of lines. But here we see the Sinai Peninsula. And if we zoom in, they came out of Ramesses and they went down the yellow road. And Sukkoth is the one with the green circle, and Edom is the place with a blue circle, and before Migdal is the red circle. So do you see the one, two, and three? So they're above red lines. And what they represent are the three routes to the way to Canaan from Egypt. So the first road is the sea road, which is the shortest road. But if they went down that route, they would have met the Philistine army. So the possibility of war was there, so they weren't led that way. And the second route is the way to Shur. So they could have gone down that route from their camp at Sukkoth, but God instructed them to go south, below. And we see the second campsite, Edom, and here they pitched their tents. And if they went further down, they would have come to the road or way to Mount Seir. But did God lead them down the way to Mount Seir? Did they go that route? How could they not? So do you think the Israelites knew the way from Egypt to Canaan? Did they know the existence of these three routes? Oh, of course. Because merchants, they would carry their wares like spices and fragrances and go down the routes. And the Israelites also shepherd flocks, so they know these routes. So they know the existence of these three routes, but God said no to the first and second routes. So then the only route remaining is the one on the way to Mount Seir. So they started going down that path. Is that correct, what I'm saying? They started going down that route. How do we know? Exodus 14, verses 1 through 2. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, So this takes place when they're coming down from Edom. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before P. Hiroth between Migdal and the sea. So can we get the uh, picture back up of the, of the routes? So after leaving... Edom, they came to the way to Mount Seir and turned in to go down that route. But God spoke to Moses saying, Stop the Israelites. And he said, Turn back. And what turn back means, means to turn around. If they had gone straight down from Edom, this phrase, to turn back, would not have come out. But 
because they had started heading down Route 3, the way to Mount Seir, God told Moses to tell Israel to turn back. Then where, are we, then where should we go? Oh, go between Migdal and the sea, is what the Lord said. So it was obvious to the Israelites from their perspective that's the only road left. But God said to turn back. Really? Oh, did another way form without us knowing? And they followed and they arrived before the Red Sea. And the waves are crashing. And they also heard, or Pharaoh also heard and found out that the Israelites had lied. He had been told, oh, we will only go on a three days journey to offer sacrifices. But he had been deceived. The Israelites had run away. And so before them was a sea and they were surrounded by mountains. And the situation was Pharaoh had brought out his entire army in pursuit of the Israelites. So will the Israelites have remained still? In front of them was a sea. On this side, the mountain. On the other side, Pharaoh was chasing them. So all had something to say. And what were they saying? Exodus 14, verses 11 through 12. Exodus 14, 11 through 12. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? So they had come out with upraised arms, crying out hallelujah on the 15th day of the first month. But now with the sea before them, and Pharaoh's army after them, everything that was in them came out through their words. And what else did they say in verse 12? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. When, so they did not want to leave when they were told to leave at first. Moses had to persuade them and convince them to do so. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has come to us and said that he will free us, let us go. But they said, no, we'll, we'll, we'll stay here. I'm used to it here. I don't know what's out there, so just leave me alone. But they witnessed God's sovereignty through the ten plagues and thought, oh, he is trustworthy. And they went out saying, God is the best, Moses is the best. But they were, when they were confronted with this danger, everything that was suppressed in them came out through their words. They were saying, why didn't you leave me behind when I told you? And they grumbled against God and Moses in this way. So Moses was flustered, anxious, not knowing what to do. And God said, Moses, what are you doing? Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand. Moses obeyed God's words and his arm was outstretched staff in hand and is that an amazing sight to behold or not an amazing sight from the Israelites point of view at that time knowing the result we know we who know the result versus the people actually at the scene all grumbling and complaining it's completely different what were the Israelites seeing? What on earth is he doing?
the moment Moses stretched out his staff, it wasn't like the seas parted in an instant, like out of a movie. That's not what it says in the Bible. From the moment Moses stretched out his staff, the wind began to blow. The sea didn't part. A strong east wind blew throughout the night. Exodus 14 verse 21 Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land so the waters were divided. So think of it as if you were there. When Moses stretched out his staff, was there a change at first? No. They only saw the wind blowing. And they're thinking, we're about to die. Do something. Are you going to make this place our graves? And all Moses is doing is stretching out his staff like this. Is anything changing? So he stretches it again. Oh, did something change? What is he doing? Is what they would have said. Is he in his right mind? I believe in somebody like that. I'm the fool. So see him stretching out his arm like this over and over. Do you think it would have been done with one stretch? And the same with Elijah when he, when they were waiting for rain. Did it rain? No. Did it rain? No. He asked the servant again and again. And this is all that Moses was doing. How did he appear? Foolish, no? Before the great sea, he was stretching out his small staff. So he looks so foolish. And that's the foolishness spoken of in 1 Corinthians 1.18. And that's in the sight of those who are perishing. So one small human being stretching out his staff before the great and vast sea. Strangely enough, there are people who believe that, oh, something is going to happen. Even though I see it now, it will happen. And to those who believe, the power of God is revealed. And according to their faith, the strong east wind blew throughout the night and dry land emerged from the Red Sea. No one could have ever imagined that they would see dry land in the middle of the sea, that amazing sight. This is how God's works are done. This is the foolish way of the cross that we are walking in. As our third main point, there are people who follow in the way. If there are people who pioneer that path, there are people who follow. And 65% of the land in Korea is are made up of mountains. And when new roads are made in Korea, they had to go through mountains by making tunnels. And some tunnels are very long. And people are amazed as they go through this tunnel. How did they make this tunnel? And then they think about who made these tunnels. How hard it would have been people whose names or faces I don't know because of their sweat and labor I am able to go down this path in five minutes very conveniently instead of having to take or go around it and take longer that's the same with the word
though there are people whose faces and names we do not know, because of the blood and sacrifices of many prophets and martyrs, we are able to receive the word, we are able to have our Bible. And only one thing do they ask of us, are those who have gone before us in faith. They tell us there is no other way. Though it, it may appear that there are many ways, there is only one true path. So do not stray from it. But I, but, I, but I hope that you will walk in this path that our fathers and elders have devoted their lives to make. And this is Moses' plea at the plains of Moab where all the first generation except two had died and he is now speaking to the second generation Israelites who seemed immature and still like children. And he set them down and reiterated the covenant and the laws. That's in the book of Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. Thus, you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you, just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to fear him. Don't ever stray from this path. When you go into Canaan, you'll be filled to your stomachs. But do not forget to walk in this path. Also in Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 through 27. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today. So if you obey these commandments, you will be blessed. And Moses wasn't saying this just to say it, but he put all of his heart as he spoke these words. Please, 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 please. It's the one spoken, or it was spoken by the one who had paved the way. Also in David's plea, when he spoke to his son Solomon, his final words, in 1 Kings 2 verses 1 through 3, as David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Don't go this and that way because of what people say. And in verse 3, Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. And this was the greatest inheritance that David passed on to his son Solomon. From the time of my youth, I was with God, and even when Saul was pursuing me for ten years, I did not stray from the way of God, but believing and fearing Him, I realized that was the true path, the only way. If I could show you my heart, I would. So Solomon, there's nothing else I can pass on to you but this.
It's because you are a true son. Even if the neighbor's son does something wrong, we don't concern ourselves after that because they're not my son. But if my do son does something, we grab them by the hair and discipline them. Why? Because he's my son. So David left it to him as a will. And it wasn't only Moses or David who do this, but all those who have gone before us in faith. In conclusion, Deuteronomy 32 verse 7 is the beginning and also the central verse in the Redemptive series. Deuteronomy 32 verse 7, Remember the days of old, consider the years of all generations, ask your father and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. Ask your father and your elders. What are we to ask? To, in, to condense it in one word, it is the path. Is this the right way? Am I going down a crooked path? Is this path one I'm going down out of stubbornness, not the one that our elders spoke of? So we're to ask again and again. Ask our Father who pioneered the way and our elders who walked down that path, no matter how difficult it got. What is the right path? What is the good way and your father and elders will show you and tell you and instruct you Acts 20 verse 24 but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God who said this? Apostle Paul. So the entire process of walking the path that he had been given, he said, I have finished that course. This is all that I was entrusted with. And one of the father and elders we are to ask, a reference in 30, Deuteronomy 32 verse 7 is Apostle Paul. This confession is not Paul's alone, but all the fathers of faith said this. I have finished what God has entrusted to me. I finished that course. And Apostle Paul and all those of faith who have gone before the, for us, are they waiting, just resting? No, even now they are with us. According to Hebrews 12 verse 1, so in Hebrews chapter 12, people of faith are listed. And the, the first verse in that chapter, therefore, since we... Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us that reassure us that this is the right path, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We are walking the same path as those of faith. Listen, in Hebrews 11, walked. And that baton in that course has been passed on to us to complete the path, the foolish way of the cross. He doesn't leave us alone to finish the way of the cross. And at times, we are slumped over exhausted 
And David will say to us, There was a time I was like that too when I was running away from Saul. But let's endure a little longer. Jonathan will come to you and lift you up. And let's say something, something so sad happens to us, then Jeremiah, the prophet of tears, will come to us and comfort us because he's been through it too. And we can think, oh, why do we live such a life like this? And Jacob, who went through all kinds of afflictions, will come and say, I know what you're going through. And after all that I've experienced, I realize that God never left, but he is raising us up. He's one who will never leave us. So don't worry. Who comes to us? Those who have gone before us. So let's read our scripture reading once again, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The new way in the midst of the Red Sea. So for our Evergreen Hill Church saints, though it may be a path that is ridiculed and criticized, but it is the, but we are sure of it. I pray that we will all run this course to its end. Let us pray. Gracious Father God, thank you. We have come upon your Holy Lord's Day and you have provided our spiritual manna and through the word you have granted us hope, comfort, and light. And Lord, we thank you so much. The way of the cross is not easy. It's so very hard with no end in sight. And we stumble and are the object of scorn and ridicule. But this path is the one that our fathers have paved with their sweat and tears. And the one who completed that path is our Savior, Jesus Christ. So though the way of the cross may appear foolish, please help us so that we experience the power of the cross that we all behold the dry ground in the middle of the Red Sea. Lord, when we are in the midst of hardship, please grant us the wisdom to ask our Father and our elders to have the wisdom to hear so that no matter what situation we may be in, we may receive new strength and power so that we can complete this course, so that we may run across and cut the tape of the race. And when we do so, when we walk that path, Those who encourage us and support us are our fellow saints. We are brethren and family through the blood of Jesus Christ. So please help us to support each other, pray for them, and sincerely speak words of encouragement so that we may all go together. And would you lead our Evergreen Hill Saints to do so? We believe it will be as we've prayed, and we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen.